Uh, traffic, uh, this is uh, Winkle, inbound from the east field inside, overhead, join uh, position for left hand down, wind 04. Okay, so what have we got in front of us? So here you can see is a very simple um, aerodrome layout with uh, with a with a runway and connective taxiways um, with uh, an apron sort of like parking area um, up to the top. Uh, we all know that that's not just one runway; that's actually two runways. So you can should be able to make out that uh, we have um, an east-west runway. So we've got two seven and zero nine. Now it's um, it's worth making a note that if you were to park your aircraft um, exactly on, say for example, the uh, threshold of runway 27, and you were bang on the centre line, your compass wouldn't read exactly to 270 degrees. Runways are laid out plus or minus five degrees. So for example, the tolerance of runway 27 will be from uh, 265 degrees to 275. So it's five degrees each side. If it was, for example, um, uh, 277 degrees, for example, that would not be runway 27. It would be runway 28. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that runway uh, numbers change as uh, the um, Earth's uh, magnetic field shifts, then um, runway numbers change okay, periodically. What else have we got there? Um, you, I'll highlight this on the screen, um, but you'll be able to see some um, some various markers on the runway. Um, the ones I'm just indicating now are what known as touchdown markers, and then the other ones are um, are aids for distance, etc., etc., etc. Okay, um, those touchdown markers. That's where you want to be touching down. You'll see um, at each end of the runway, we've got white lines, white and black lines. These are known in the aviation world as piano keys, because funny enough, they look like piano keys. These donate the official uh, or denote the official um, uh, start, if you like, of, of the runway. So you've got piano keys at each end. That's actually indicating the usable length of the runway available for 2709. Um, now, the more eagle-eyed among you will have noticed there's some bits sort of like beyond each threshold. So if you look to the right of um, the 27 threshold, you can see that there's um, a bit of taxiway that, um, that comes around and then sweeps into the threshold with some arrows pointing forward. That's actually to allow aircraft to taxi onto the runway that want full length. So if you were to come come from the taxiway that comes straight down from the apron, by the time the aircraft taxis on, it's probably going to be somewhere near nearer the um, the first set of markers there to the left of the uh, 27 um, indicator. So it's lost a little bit of usable um, runway. So if, you know, if it's hot and the aircraft's heavy, you know, and it wants every uh, sort of you know, bit of length, um, not so much a length available, but it needs the distance available, then um, what it's able to do, um, obviously with uh, through air traffic, is they'll taxi it around that short little bit. They can taxi on happy days, and um, they can they can have the full length available to them. You'll notice at the other end there's a bit sticking out with some yellow chevrons. Typically, especially with military airfields, it's known as an over and undershoot area. So that area, again, is not typically a length of uh, runway that the aircraft would use. But for example, freight failure, then um, what will happen is it will overrun onto that area and um, it will basically um, help to slow the aircraft down. You wouldn't want to drive like a heavy fire truck onto that because it would actually sink into it. It's a bit like, to be honest, although not to the extreme, of the escape lanes that you, um, you sometimes see uh, going down hills. You see, like, you know, in case of brake failure, shoot off right here. 
I mean, that's it's normally just really, really soft. Should we say not sort of like heavily rolled, sort of like tarmac type area that um, if an aircraft was to run into it, they would just sink into it and it would help to um, help to slow them down. OK, let's have a look at taxiways. So I've changed the image now so you can see that the taxiway, the taxiway center lines now that uh, was on there originally have got um, letters um, attached to them. Um, I've just made this up, but you know, an, an aerodrome, for example, their taxi route would follow normally um, follow some kind of um, sort of like standard sort of uh, process with regards to numbering. But of course, that does change as aerodromes expand and you know taxiways are you know created, taken away, whatever's. Um, so yeah, it just is what it is, really. That's why you got an aerodrome chart. Um, so what have we got? So um, well, let's start with A. So you can see Taxiway Alpha it sort of links from uh, from the apron there, and it goes um, left to right, and it sort of like sweeps around, um, and then to the right you've got Taxiway Bravo, which comes, if you like, from the from the north of the complex, um, morphs into to Taxiway um, Alpha. Um, you could have a separate bit of taxiway there where um, Alpha Bravo meet, but just to keep it simple, we'll say that Bravo goes all the way down to meet the next main horizontal uh, or left to right, if you like, you're looking at it now, taxiway, taxiway Echo, which basically runs parallel to the runway. There you can see Charlie Delta there right, that joins Echo at the other end, and then we can see that we've got taxiway. Taxiway Echo basically, I've sort of indicated here, would run down the length of the main runway it comes from the um, if you like the 09 threshold all the way down parallel with the runway till it gets to Delta where you've got dedicated taxiways uh, Golf and Foxtrot which lead on to the runway. The slanted ones that you can see taxiways India and Hotel they're pretty much is what they what they are on the on the tin really they're rapid exit taxiways. So um, um, to be fair I mean obviously this is a cartoon image these in reality these would probably be a bit more spaced spaced out depending on the length of the runway so uh, once the aircraft's touched down um, if able then it can it can exit um, you know smartly at, the, at those um, those taxiways when you say rapid exit it's not means that they're going to do it at 200 mile an hour it just means that they're able to exit the uh, the runway um, expeditiously so those basically the ta are the uh, are the taxiways and they say they're um, they're indicated uh, alphabetically um, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, all that good stuff. So, um, for example, um, it's uh, certainly when I'm, you know, giving you any kind of um, uh, any kind of taxi clearance, you know, you'll be given um, you'll you'll be given you know from a particular location, you know, taxi to the runway. So you'll be told what runway is in use. So we'll say runway two seven. So I've just changed the image now. So I've given um, taxi instructions to park to the uh, or to a taxi, I should say, to the holding point for um, runway 27. So you can see here that the uh, the red line is indicating that we're going to use taxiways Alpha, Echo, and Golf. So it'll be, for example, Red Pilot taxi to holding point Golf One via taxiways Alpha, Echo, Golf. Runway 27 in use, and you'll be given uh, in use, I should say, and then you'll also be given the um, uh, the uh, the Q and H, okay, the um, the uh, pressure setting for your altimeter, which has been adjusted to uh, to sea level. Okay, holding points. Um, all of these taxiways, to be fair, will have holding points where air traffic can stop aircraft to allow aircraft to taxi through, etc., etc. I'm, I'm not really too worried about those. Um, but the main ones that um, that we need to make sure that uh, that we um, pay attention to are the ones that um, uh, are associated with, you know, joining the runway. So you'll notice that um, like the 09 threshold there on Taxiway Echo, you can see that there's a yellow bar across it. The rapid taxiway, rapid um, taxiway exit, India, hotel, and taxiways uh, Golf and Foxtrot have all got yellow markers across them. I'll bring an image up now on the screen. Um, you can see exactly what uh, holding point uh, would look like uh, in reality. Um, some of our 
airports in DCS um, actually have um, uh, holding points. In fact, going back to going back to the taxiway uh, markings, um, some of the newer airports now have also got um, you know taxiway um, taxiway marker boards, so you can actually see you know where. Uh, you, where a taxiway is, you can see where, okay, I'm on taxiway um, Echo, for, it, for example, you'll be able to identify where, when taxiway Golf is coming up because you'll see the boards, okay, big yellow board with, um, you know, with, uh, with, with a G on it, for example. Um, so the holding points, yeah, these holding points are set back um, a specific distance from the runway. I'm not going to get into the technicalities um, associated with that. But it's it's for safety. It's for um, to to make sure that the basically the runway and any instrument instruments uh, landing system, for example, associated with that runway is protected. So um, we don't want a great big jumbo jet, for example, you know, uh, parking in front of a navigation aid, which is going to block the um, if an aircraft coming in using it, then you know it's it's going to it's going to mess things up for them. So these are set a, a fair old distance back from the uh, from the runway. Now, one of the things I've noticed, you know, historically, that is that you know we don't really pay um, you know, much respect, shall we say, to an active runway. Um, if you are asked, for example, to to taxi, you know, if you've if you've been given some taxi instructions moving forward, and you've been um, you've been asked to say, for example, hold at Golf One, you know that that you know knowing now what you know, you know that you're going to have to hold short of the runway. If there's uh, markers there, if there's a holding point there, then you need to make sure your nose of the aircraft, the very front of your aircraft, does not cross that line. If there isn't anything there, because, you know, like, for example, the old sort of like historic stuff in the Caucasus, for example, you know, there might not be any uh, markers there. If there isn't, then use a little bit of, um, you know, sort of bit of um, common sense, really, and just look at your 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 taxiway width and keep a taxiway width you know away from from the edge of the runway um, because what we don't want is aircraft that are too close especially if there's someone coming in to land and they see an aircraft like right next to the runway it's like i, I really don't know if that aircraft's gonna you know pull out in front of me so just keep a, a, a sensible um sensible distance away from the from the edge of the runway you know whether you're being controlled or even if it's an open server for example um, because you know you might be able to see, for example, you know an aircraft that's on final. So just just a little bit, it's a bit about respect, really. And um, for us, as in the real world, landing aircraft have priority. Okay, so if there's an aircraft on final or anyone that's called final, you need to wait at the holding point or safe distance away to let that aircraft land. Okay, so let's talk about um, when we vacate um, a runway. So we'll say, for example, runway 27 is in use. So we've got an aircraft landing right to left. The aircraft lands and um, let's just say uh, the aircraft takes uh, the rapid, ex uh, rapid uh, taxiway exit to, to India. So the aircraft lands and um, it's once you've occupied a runway, that runway is yours. No one else can use it. So um, if we've got multiple aircraft landing, obviously, like we normally do, we say that, um, that the, the, the runway is free. The runway is not technically free until your aircraft, the whole of your aircraft has crossed that holding point line. Now, I have noticed that, um, you know, literally some aircraft, you know, are technically still on the runway when they've, they've, they've called that the runway is clear, you know, they've left it. But you need to make sure that you've that you've um, you've cleared the active runway by a sufficient distance. So either A, by once you've crossed that um, uh, that holding point line, um, or B, when you've crossed that imaginary line where you know your your aircraft, you know the tail end of your aircraft is, for example, a width of a taxiway across. And the correct phraseology, okay, is runway vacated. Okay, so you vacate. Okay, happy days. Okay, let's have a look now at circuits, the different parts of a circuit and uh, various calls, um, radio calls that are involved. At the top of the screen, you can see uh, you can see our aerodrome with our runway. Now we're going to say the wind today is uh, coming from our left as we look at it. So um, the wind is coming from the west. 
Okay, so that means it's a westerly wind. It's actually coming from the west dead on. So the the, the winds uh, originating from 270 degrees and at whatever speed. Remember we said before that um, wherever the wind is, the wind is measured in two things, where it's coming from, its origin, and how fast it's coming from. Not where it's going, it's where it's coming from. So we got a westerly wind at um, whatever strength. Okay, happy days. So we've got uh, circuits. We've got the option of doing a, a right or a left-hand circuit. As a generalism, to be fair, most circuits tend to be to the left. Um, but the circuit direction at um, any aerodrome will be dictated by various things, such as terrain, um, any built-up sort of congested areas. So, for example, if there's a, a town to the uh, to the south um, of, um, of, uh, of this location that we're looking at now, then for noise abatement, safety, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then they'll they'll opt, for example, to use a right-hand circuit as standard. Um, but uh, we're going to use um, um, left-hand circuits in this example. Okay, so there are five different uh, different legs, if you like, to this circuit. So as soon as we take off, um, we're flying uh, upwind. Okay, so that's the upwind leg. Then once we've climbed and um, we're going to turn left, so our first left-hand turn, that's going to be the crosswind leg. Okay. Then when we're positioned, uh, you know, a sensible distance uh, away from uh, from the aerodrome, though the runway is still in sight at this point. We're going to do another left-hand turn and we're going to fly parallel with the runway back down the opposite way. So we're going to be downwind. Then once we get to uh, an appropriate uh, position, we're going to turn on to base leg. OK. And then once uh, once we're approaching the extended uh, center line of the runway, we're going to turn on to final. So the uh, the five um, the five uh, positions of our circuit are upwind, crosswind, downwind, base leg, and final. Now, um, two of these are mandatory to report okay, in, for uh, real aviation, and it's going to be the same for us. Those mandatory reports are downwind and final. Okay. For us, it just aids situational awareness. So if um, you know somebody calls that they're downwind or final, it, we we know roughly where they are, and that's exactly, to be fair, one of the reasons why it's, it, 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 um, they do it in real life as well. Plus, it also you know keys the controller up to um, for other stuff that's that's going on and additional you know things that they need to do um, you know coming up in relation to that particular flight. So our mandatory calls downwind and final. OK. Now, our circuit height, our standard circuit height is going to be 1000 feet above aerodrome level, AAL. OK, so um, and that's pretty much standard circuit height above the level of the aerodrome, 1000 feet. So, for example, what you would do is take off, climb straight ahead, um, climb up to 1000 feet. If you get yourself to a position where you're at 1000 feet, you know, an appropriate distance where you want to turn on to crosswind, then happy days. You can just uh, level out, you know, put in a turn or you can you can put in a climbing turn, for example. But you certainly, you know, in an ideal world, want to be, you know, at your thousand feet above aerodrome level by the time, you know, you get to sort of like mid sort of crosswind position. Then when you turn on to downwind, you can then start to adjust your height on the downwind leg appropriately. Um, so, for example, if you feel that um, you want to be at uh, 800 feet by the end of the downwind leg, then, for example, in a mid downwind position, you can then start to descend, lose a couple of hundred feet and then um, level off. And then when you turn on to base, you can be at 800 feet. And then um, when you're ready to turn on to final, then you can be uh, ready to uh, start your final approach. Perfect. Um, the airfield circuit height of 1,000 feet above aerodrome level. This is where you're going to have to you're going to have to get a little bit more information. So, for example, one of the key bits of information you're going to need is what is the um, elevation of the aerodrome? How high is the aerodrome above mean sea level? One of the ways that we can do that, you know, pretty simply, is to have a look at the F10 map. So, 
bring up the uh, F10 map, move your cursor over to the uh, over the airfield on on on, on the runway, and um, see what the highest point of that main runway is. So if it's 500 feet, for example, then with your altimeter adjusted to uh, atmospheric pressure at uh, sea level, then you should be reading uh, 1,500 feet. I'm not going to go into altimetry right now, but I will be in one of the forthcoming lessons. OK, so all of this will will hopefully make sense with regards to what we set our altimeter to. If, say, for example, you only wish to practice circuits, at, uh, you know, you join an open ser service session, for example, and you want to, to practice circuits, then uh, a pressure setting which is acceptable to use is, is known as QFE. This is where we set our altimeter on the aerodrome, if you like, where it reads zero. So your altimeter would read zero. Then you can take all height readouts from that uh, from the altimeter zeroed for that for that particular aerodrome. Okay, but if you're going anywhere, if you're going anywhere away from the airfield, the standard procedure is to uh, set our altimeters to the um, atmospheric pressure either in um, millibars or um, uh, inches, okay, which has been um, dis which is actually displayed in the briefing page. Okay, so we need to make sure that we start to look because this is real. Um, this is going to be very very important, especially if we end up you, you know um, using missions that have got different pressure systems you know over the map because um, because the altimeter is basically a pressure sensor. That's what's talking about standard barometric altimeters now. Because it's a pressure sensor, it's uh, obviously uh, affected by pressure, um, and various weather systems have various degrees of pressure, and that affects the altimeter as well. So in the real world, areas are broken up into um, altimeter uh, pressure setting regions, if you like, um, and as you go into to a new area, you know, air traffic will um, uh, will inform, for example, an aircraft that um, what the regional pressure set, uh, pressure setting is. For that particular area, okay, it's mainly associated if they're transiting through for terrain clearance, etc. So if they know there's a, you know, a hill at say 3,000 feet, they want to clear that by say, you know, 1,000 feet, so they want to be at 4,000 feet. They need to make sure that their altimeter is set correctly, okay, things like that. But we'll come on to that a bit later. Might sound a bit complicated. It's not, you know, there's nothing in this that's massively complicated. You know, it's uh, it's all relatively simple. But there's there's just a you know a, a bit of it a bit to it okay um, but for now on our circuits okay thousand feet above aerodrome level whatever that is um, so you can either set it to um, uh, to the to the, what's known as the Q and H where you'll get your reading above uh, mean sea level or you can set it to QFE where it will read zero if you like um, on, on the aerodrome itself on our five legs as we said is upwind crosswind downwind, base leg, and final. Downwind and final are mandatory calls. Okay, so let's have a look at the different positions that we can be um, on the downwind leg. Now, as we've already um, discussed, it's mandatory that we report downwind, okay? Now, um, in, the, uh, in the real world, you know, in the it's sort of you say in this sort of circuit sort of environment, as soon as you've turned downwind, that's where you will make the call. I'm downwind. Okay, so it's red one, downwind. Happy days. You can be two other positions if you like, downwind. And that is um if you like the next one would be um uh, mid downwind. So um as you can see here I'll just put a put a mark on the screen which is directly a beam okay directly south of the aerodrome okay that's in the midpoint midpoint if you like of the downwind downwind leg and then the uh, other one that you can be is you can be late downwind so as you can see there by the mark that i've put on the screen with regards to the downwind leg leg itself you can see that the the late downwind position you know is is really late now you don't have to report those you just need to report downwind now if you happen to turn downwind immediately from the crosswind leg then you can just report downwind okay you don't really need to make an additional call not unless for example you know if there's uh, if there's a controller like myself you know i might say okay continue on the downwind leg uh, until advised 
um, and you think, hang on a minute, I've gone a long way, and just be, and then you can just make a call save, you know, just a nudge the controller, sort of, you know, sort of say, okay, I'm late downwind. Oh shit, I forgot about Rich. And then we we'll turn them in. But yeah, no. So you don't test in an ideal world. Make the call for the downwind as soon as you're able. If you can't because there's other people on the radio, you know, or you've been tied up with managing the aircraft for whatever reason, and you found yourself in a mid downwind position, for example, then just call mid downwind. Because one, you've called downwind, so we know there's an aircraft in the circuit. You've called mid downwind, so we know roughly where that aircraft is. It's in a mid downwind position. So that can obviously help the controller, but more importantly, um, in relation to uh, everyone else that's flying, we know there's an aircraft in a mid downwind position. So if there's another aircraft joining, for example, they need to make sure that they, they join well upwind, if you like, of that of that aircraft. Okay. The other one then is if you're in a late downwind position. Um, now, for a normal circuit, we're going to look at how this can be how this circuit can be adjusted uh, moving forward. But um, as it stands at the moment, if you were to call like um, just as if you're about to turn onto base leg, you can sort of say, "Okay, I'm in, I'm, I'm late downwind. You know, turning left base now." Okay, don't ever just say turning base. Give a like left base, left hand circuit, base leg. Everyone knows where you are. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you've got downwind, which you would ideally call at the um, as soon as you've um, turned um, downwind from the crosswind leg. Mid downwind, directly a beam of the aerodrome or the runway, and then you've got late downwind, which is obviously you know towards the end of that particular leg. Okay, so your next major call then is going to be when you're on final. So if you're in a normal circuit pattern, once you've um, completed the, uh, the the base leg and you've uh, you know you've turned on to final, then yeah, make the final call. Um, pro probably the best way to do it as well is rather than just say final, just say you know final runway two seven, because then everyone knows it's just a little nudge thing, oh yeah, a little reminder that everyone knows um, you know which runway you're coming in on. If someone says, you know, final runway 09, it's like, mm, hang on, what's going on here? Okay, so you make your final call. Now, like your base leg, leg, your final calls can be um, uh, can be different as well. So, for example, for a normal circuit pattern, and we'll look at the um, positioning, if you like, normal positioning for a, for a standard circuit in a second. But you would make your uh, your call that you're on finals, you know, at the uh, at the standard position, if you like. But you can also be short final, or you could be long final. So if you're a little bit closer than you would be on the uh, on on a standard circuit, so on a standard circuit, you know, maybe go out to about a mile, maybe to something like that, um, to give yourself a you know, a bit of a run in to adjust, do your final checks, you know, position you know appropriately on the center line and, and uh, glide slope, etc. Um, but there may be a, a situation where you might want to uh, turn on to a, onto a short final or very short final. Um, for example, if you fly on a, a warbird where um, in an ideal situation, these aircraft need to be flown in in a turn, you know, continuously. They don't like the previously when I or probably still on the screen now, the rectangular circuit is not really suited well to warbirds because of the fact they're a low wing monoplane. And you've got a really long nose, you know. You, I think they said that you can't see something like two, three, four miles ahead of you, you know, with a Merlin engine or something like that, you know. So, it's um, yeah, front front all sort of visibilities, you know, a bit pants. So the way that they deal with it in a circuit is um, it just make it a continuous, you know, continuous turn. So from the downwind, um, you know, late downwind uh, section, rather than turning 90 degrees, if you like, onto a onto a, a base leg you would just do a continue you know, con slow continuous turn at a rate that's going to put you basically as soon as you roll out you know on the on the center line of the runway so um, what you'll find you know a lot of the time the guys will do is and um, they initiate the turn you know pretty much when they're being the touchdown point and then um, you know make that a, a nice gentle you know continuous turn um, so that when they roll out, literally, bosh, you know, they're um, they're uh, they're over the touchdown point for the runway. Um, 
So the positions, um, if you like, for the for the final calls, it's just going to be final when you're on your normal final, you know, approach position, if you like, you know, sort of two miles, something like that, or you know, or less. Or if you're in a wall bird and you're you're bringing it in, then you you know you can call it um, you can call turning final, especially if you're going to be imminently landing. So you know, yeah, you know, you know uh, turning finals uh, two seven, um, you know, that type of that type of thing. Um, if you're anything more than a couple of miles, then you know, really will sort of like you know regard that as being a long final, you know. So you know, so you could be a long final, for example, even at six miles, you know, uh, which is like you know, sort of position that we would be in, you know, like on a carrier, for example, that we wouldn't make those calls in that particular way. But uh, there's no reason why you can't be, you know, can't be on a final approach track, you know, ten miles away, for example. Um, but at least if you make that call, you can say, like, okay, I'm a 10 mile final for 27. At least anyone in the immediate vicinity then um, knows that you're, you're 10 miles away. They know roughly what sort of speed you're doing. Um, so they can make a judgment call then on whether to, um, you know, if they're doing a circuit nipping and land ahead of you and they got enough time to vacate or whether somebody wants to get themselves airborne. But one of the things that we must, um, we must uh, enforce, I guess, if you like, is that any aircraft that is um, that is on, on final finals to land gets priority? Okay, so um, they uh, aircraft on as in real life aircraft that are on finals they have priority. They're coming into land. You don't know if they've got you know they may be short of fuel. They may not have enough fuel for a go around that type of thing. Um, but um, anything that's on final gets priority. Okay, so one of the things that um, that we've uh, not discussed yet is um, where do we actually turn on to base leg? Because it's all very well and good me drawing you know pretty pictures on the screen, but how do we do this in reality? It's dead easy. So let's uh, let's talk our way through it. So we're in a position where downwind and we're a beam our touchdown point. Now what we do is we uh, continue to fly the downwind leg. But what we need to be doing is looking over, in this case, our left shoulder. And we're looking uh, to get the touchdown point at a position where it's 45 degrees over your left shoulder. OK, so um, I've just uh, uh, changed the graphic now so you can see where the uh, where the aircraft would be when the touchdown point is approximately 45 degrees over your left shoulder. At that point, that's where you would normally make your turn okay onto base leg one of the things also that we need to do is when we do our turns you know in the circuit in any circuit is we need to we need to nice really aim for nice uh, nice 90 degree turns you can your compass can aid you so for example you know if you are uh, just so happens we're lined up on 2709 um, if you know for example on your crosswind leg when you turn if you're heading um, on the uh, 270 you know you're going to turn left so you, you need to be looking for a heading of 180 that type of thing um so what try and this is really down to your own um your own personal you know discipline really in relation to circuit work but uh, so for example there's no point turning on to downwind and um your should we say got a got a little bit of left in your in your in your heading because you're only going to narrow the distance between your downwind track and the um, uh, and the final approach track, if you like. So you've actually got less distance. So I'll put a graphic up now, which uh, which sort of like demonstrates that. Um, so you, you really want to be certainly when you're you know you're downwind, you want a nice parallel track, because otherwise if you're in in a left hand circuit, if you're a little bit left, you're only going to have less track miles. Or if you you know if you're a little bit more to the to the right, say, then you you're going to increase it. But that's not too bad because you can deal with that. But um, certainly losing track miles when you turn onto base leg is not a good position to be in, especially if you're, you know, if you're in a fast jet because you're going to overshoot your final approach track. So, um, so you know, professionalism with regards to the circuit pattern is key. So as I said, look for the uh, uh, 45 degree over your left shoulder. Then you can make your turn onto base, and then uh, you know the radius of turn that you're going to need to uh, to get onto final. Um, the aircraft should already be configured at that point with some flaps and gear down so you can uh, roll out onto your final approach track. Happy days.
Okay, so we've looked at the normal circuit pattern. We've looked at um, uh, circuits for warbirds. We've looked at adjusting the circuit with regards to you know, positioning further uh, downwind to um, to sort of like a, you know to, for a long final. We've looked at uh, you know um, joining straight in, should we say, on on long on long final. But there's a there's another way that we can adjust the circuit, and this is now um, by uh, extending further away from the aerodrome. Uh, beam the aerodrome so for for example extending the, the crosswind leg okay to um so we end up in for example a, a wide downwind uh, position um this has got um several advantages um for example you know you may have uh, an additional aircraft uh, in the circuit you may be slightly faster than that aircraft so you might have a prop aircraft for example downwind um, you may be in a, either a faster, you know, prop aircraft or maybe a, maybe a jet. So, for example, the uh, the normal uh, fixed wing aircraft can carry out the normal uh, circuit um, uh, pattern. And as a jet, for example, a faster aircraft, what you can do is, I mean, obviously, ultimately, you can just slow down, you know, and match the speed um, or less. Um, but one of the things that you could do is you could extend the crosswind leg. To give you, you're basically what you're doing is you're just adding track miles, you're adding distance. So you can uh, extend the crosswind leg before you turn downwind, um, which again is 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 giving the uh, the aircraft that's got shorter track miles to run um, uh, a chance to obviously complete what they need to do. So you're just stalling for time really. Um, you can extend, um, sorry, you can uh, carry out the downwind leg, turn downwind um, uh, as normal. Or you may even opt to extend the downwind leg slightly by a, mi a mile or two. But certainly by uh, um, going wide downwind can be advantageous, um, you know, depending on the, on, on the situation. Calls are exactly the same. So your radio calls would still be, for example, downwind. But in this case, to give it, give the controller and also any other aircraft situational awareness, um, you could then just report um, wide left hand downwind. OK. So then everyone knows that you're, you're downwind, but you're just a little bit further away from the airfield. OK. Um, the airfield is because we're doing a visual circuit. The airfield is still in sight. The runway is still in sight at this time. So you wouldn't call it wide downwind at 20 miles away. OK. So um, you, or because this is a visual circuit, the runway is um, the airfield is uh, visual at all times. So it's just another way that um, you know that we can position ourselves that which we may you know find of uh, find of use. So let's have a little bit of a recap. Um, circuits probably one of the most important things you can do um, with regards to you know flight discipline and um, you know learning how to fly a new aircraft really, because we've all got to be able to take off, we've all got to be able to land, and flying a circuit you know um, achieves that very very well. Whenever we, whenever we arrive at, aerod at an aerodrome, we're always going to be joining from part of the circuit. So learning how to how the circuit works is very very important. Another reason that it can be important and very very useful is um, imagine a scenario now where you know you're coming into land and for some reason. You're not able to land. Either you've got a configuration error, or maybe there's an aircraft on the runway, or you're just in the wrong position. Something's not just, you know, it's not right for you to to carry out um, uh, the actual final landing. So what you'll need to do is you'll need to initiate a go around. So what you would uh, what you would do in reality is um, basically increase your power and then join the circuit and reposition for another approach. So knowing how to fly the circuit is very, very important. So if, if it doesn't, if that landing doesn't work out for you, you're not just going to, you know, whiz it around and come back in again. You need to follow the, the, the set procedures. So flying the circuit is the way to do it. If you're in the circuit, you have priority. So any aircraft uh, joining, they have to give way to you. OK, and likewise, obviously, if you're one of those joining aircraft, you need to give way to aircraft that are in the circuit and position behind, you know, as we discussed uh, appropriately. So the circuit is a really, really useful tool. And it's not something that we do 
enough of really in reality so whenever there's an open server practice some circuits and we'll certainly for the future we'll uh, we'll try and uh, you know get more people at an aerodrome and uh, you know fly in the circuit pattern both controlled and uncontrolled because one we're learning all new good stuff and certainly we're going to be learning new skills that we you know that will enhance our missions okay so circuits very important and remember, when you're in the circuit, watch your speeds. So maximum speed for jets, 210 knots, props, about 160. But as we discussed before, there's no reason why aircraft of mixed types cannot share the circuit. OK, but just uh, don't we don't want nobody getting cut up. OK, so now we're going to have a look at the overhead join. So as you can see from the uh, graphic on the screen, it looks quite complicated, but actually it's not. Um, so you can see the circuit direction in green there, and you can see that we've got aircraft joining from all different uh, directions. But there is a set procedure that we need to follow to make sure that we, we join the, the uh, circuit correctly and safely. So let's have a look. OK, so we've got our runway. Uh, 2709. Let's put up some wind so you can see that we've got a surface wind uh, coming from the west, 270x whatever knots. So we need to be uh, using runway 27. Now, the circuit pattern, as we know, can be uh, left or right hand, uh, depending on various parameters. But today we're going to do a left hand circuit. Okay, so up on the screen we can see our left hand circuit with our normal. Uh, legs as we discussed so one of the things that we just need to be aware of when we're in the circuit is we need to watch our speeds okay so as you can see that I uh, put an indication there of maximum speeds now these are maximum speeds not routine speeds you should be doing but for jets we're looking at maximum speed of 210 knots indicated and props 160 knots okay so that's maximum speeds now there's no reason to be fair why most jets can't or most aircraft i should say can't fly the circuit in unison so for example with the harrier we can fly that down really slow so there's no excuse for example for a harrier to overtake a spitfire in the circuit okay so it's it's almost literally like follow the leader around. OK, you're going to maintain separation. But those are just uh, an indication of maximum speeds. OK, so we need to watch our speeds in the circuit at all times. OK, so on the circuit, there's uh, there's what's known as a dead side and a live side. Now, we're f this is pretty obvious to be to be honest, but as you can see, I've indicated there that because it's a left hand circuit, the left hand pattern is the live side and obviously the side we're not using is known as uh, known as the dead side and i've indicated there by the uh, by the green and, uh, and and the pink shading so let's have a look at how we would uh, how we would do an overhead join so in the first example as you can see we're going to be joining from the southwest so we've got an air an aircraft if you like wide left hand downwind uh, position uh, that could be many miles away to be fair um, but wherever he is that's that's where he is so he's he's, jo he's joining from a downwind position so how do we how do we position ourselves well what we're going to do is we're going to um, continue downwind and obviously we're in a wide position at this point and then what we're going to do is uh, when we're a beam the um, the touchdown point, if you like, thereabouts. It doesn't have to be exactly as I've shown on here, with the uh, with the red track. But um, you know, if it's uh, fairly close to that, happy days. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue on that track, but we're going to maintain 2,000 feet above aerodrome level. Okay. So whatever the level of the aerodrome is, we want to be 2,000 feet above it. So if you're operating off Q and H, where your altimeter is adjusted um, to uh, uh, to the pressure adjusted for sea level, then um, fair enough. Then, uh, for example, if it's uh, if it's 500 feet, then you need to you need to be uh, you need to be looking at 2,500 feet on your altimeter. Or if you know what the Q and H is, then you can you you can if you wish adjust it to the correction uh, the um, QFE, I should say. If you know what the QFE is, 
then you can uh, you can adjust it to, uh, to to that your altimeter to that setting, and it will read zero. Easiest thing to do, in all fairness, is just leave it set to the uh, to the regional Q and H, and then just add 500 feet on to um, to anything that you're doing. Okay, so um, so what we're going to do is we're going to continue. We're going to maintain a minimum of 2,000 feet at this point. So it could be at 3,000 feet if you wanted. But the closer you are to 2,000, the better. But you're not going to drop below 2,000 feet. The reason why we're not going to drop below 2,000 feet is the circuit height, as we know, is one th is the maximum of 1,000 feet above the aerodrome level. So that gives, uh, in theory, 1,000 foot of separation being between aircraft joining overhead and the circuit traffic. Okay. So we're always going to be 1,000 feet above for separation purposes. So as you can see, we're going to um, uh, we're going to fly in, if you like, uh, fly north um, to the dead side of the aerodrome, and then we're going to turn left and position ourselves so that uh, so we're flying south, if you like, on a sh on a on a crosswind leg, okay, to uh, to join the circuit downwind, okay. We're going to join the circuit downwind. Again, we must ensure that. Uh, we maintain a minimum of 2,000 feet until we are the live side of the uh, traffic pattern, okay, the circuit pattern. So we're going to join the live side, and then at that point we can uh, we can start to descend to our circuit height, okay, of 1,000 feet. Now this is important. There may be aircraft in the circuit pattern. So for example, there may be aircraft um, doing circuits. In which case, if you're joining, you must, like you would do if, for example, if you're joining a motorway, then, um, you know, you need to make sure that you filter in. And it's the same thing with this. If you are, because you're joining the circuit, you have to make sure that you filter in. We don't want anyone cutting anyone up, which tends to happen. Okay, so you need to filter in, and that's obviously ideally behind any traffic. And then you follow that uh, traffic uh, around uh, the circuit as required. If it's something that's really slow and you can't fly that slow, then obviously, as we talked before, you can modify the circuit slightly by going, uh, for example, uh, to a, a wide um, downwind uh, position to give yourself some more track miles. But in an ideal situation, that there, there, there shouldn't be any reason why we can't all slot in the circuit together. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to continue with the circuit and then uh, you're going to, as I say, when you cross into the live side, descend to uh, one, the uh, circuit height of 1,000 feet above aerodrome level. And then you're going to position yourself for a, for a downwind uh, position. Okay, and as we said, downwind is a mandatory call. Now you want to continue downwind and join the normal circuit pattern. So as I said, our maximum speed is uh, 210 knots. Downwind, turn on to, in this case, left base. Um, again, obviously, to be fair, by the time you make, make your base turn, your gear want, wants to be down. You want to be sort of, you know, obviously a lot less than 210 knots. Almost, um, you know, coming back down to when you turn on to finals for your uh, um, approach speed. But yeah, onto left base, descend as required, and then position yourself uh, on finals. Call final, and then uh, land the aircraft. And then, as we discussed, you know, call vacated. Um, once you're uh, once you're clear of the runway. Okay, so moving on then. So that's great from uh, joining from uh, from the position that uh, we've got there, if you like, from sort of like a downwind position. Um, but what do we do if we want to join, uh, for example, from uh, from the east, but from the dead side? So uh, what we can do, I'll just bring change the graphic now, so you can see that we're approaching from the dead side. All we do. To be brutally honest, is we literally can, uh, if you like, continue on a on a southerly track and then pick up that same track, and we carry out the the exact same processes uh, as as we've discussed. So it's um, it's fairly straightforward, really. But again, you need to make sure that you maintain a minimum of 2,000 feet above the level of the aerodrome until such times, obviously, as you're ready to descend to 1,000 feet before you join the circuit. Okay, and always announce what you're doing. Okay. So what we've got now is we've got an aircraft that is uh, joining from the southeast. So how do we how do we do that? Well, as you can see, again we just join from that position. 
So we're almost joining from not quite an upwind position, but where we're joining from the, uh, if you like, from the um, from sort of like midway or three quarters of the way down the downwind position. So we literally join from that point again, minimum 2000 feet, join that position. And then as soon as we, um, if you like, cross, cross the uh, touchdown area, you know, we can then um, uh, position ourselves uh, more downwind on the dead side to pick up the track, descend down to circuit height, position um, uh, onto downwind, filter in with any traffic that's in the circle, in the circle, in the circuit, and then, um, you know, left base, final, happy days, everyone's a winner. So you can see now we've got an aircraft uh, coming in from the east. Um, he's on the dead side of the uh, of the pattern. And what that aircraft is going to do is it's going to join, okay, if you like, on the on the dead side, downwind dead side, if you like. And then it's going to position, cross onto the live side. It's going to main tooth, main, remain at uh, 2,000 feet above air drum level until such times it's in the uh, live uh, part of the circuit. And then descend down to 1,000 feet, filter in, continue downwind, base leg final, everyone's a winner. Okay, happy days. So what do we do if we've got a, a number of aircraft in formation that um, want to join overhead and then uh, position to join the circuit and land? Well, they, to be fair, it's very, very similar to what we've just looked at. So as you can see on the screen now, we've got three Harriers. Um, they're upwind on the dead side and they're basically going to carry out the, uh, like a hybrid version of what we've just done, but based, if you like, on our carrier um, uh, uh, approach with the running brake. So basically what will happen is um, the leader will, um, uh, once they're in a position to um, obviously come onto the live uh, side of the circuit, is they'll just perform a running brake. Now you'll notice at the, at the moment that the aircraft are in echelon right. So if you're joining a left-hand circuit from this position, you'll be, uh, you'll be in an echelon right formation. But you can imagine that if you're in an echelon right and we swap this around, so you're joining a, a right-hand circuit, the, um, the lead is going to be cutting across and inside of the, of the other aircraft. So you'd need to be uh, echelon um, left in that position if you were joining from the opposite, you know, from the to a right-hand circuit. So you need to be the you know, the aircraft need to be positioned correctly to start off with. So you'd be in an echelon right, as I said, minimum 2,000 feet above aerodrome level. Um, the leader will perform a running brake to uh, positions to join the life uh, side of the circuit and then descend down to 1,000 feet above aerodrome level and then continue to push, uh, to uh, obviously position for the, for the downwind leg and continue on with the circuit, circuit pattern as normal. And then what the uh, preceding aircraft will do, again, we'll, we'll perform a um, you know, 10 second intervals or so, or as, as discussed, um, perform um, uh, their break 10 seconds apart. And then so they end up in a position where they are downwind, but then you've got a spread you know, between, the, between the aircraft. So you've got, um, you've got trap mile distance between the first and the last aircraft. Um, you, we really, really do need to make sure that um, you know we position ourselves appropriately and we watch our speeds, okay? Because um, if, the, for example, in this um, in, in this example, if you've got the, the first two aircraft, you know, have slowed down a bit, you know, um, and knocked off a little bit of speed on the downwind leg, and number three on the left there is uh, still tanking it in, is going to catch catch those aircraft up uh, very, very quickly. So you need to maintain situational awareness. You need to watch your speed. Okay. So yep. Yeah, so once you're in that position, it's just it's just same old really. You know, downwind checks. You know, check your height, maybe 800 feet, for example. Um, uh, at the end of the downwind leg, turn onto base, gear flaps down, all that good stuff. Turn on the final, call final, land, vacate, happy days, tea and chips. Now in the real world, obviously this is going to be controlled. So there's an air traffic controller in the tower that's um, going to be sequencing all the aircraft, you know, uh, passing traffic information and also telling aircraft to do certain things uh, so they can keep aircraft separated and choreographing, you know, the, the whole thing. It's like an aerial ballet, really, from a, from a tower uh, controller's um, uh, perspective. Um, but we don't have the luxury of that, or 99% of the time we're not going to have the luxury of that. 
Um, so we have to do it all ourselves. Okay, so a few key things that um, we just need to be aware of. Okay, number one, maintain separation. So wherever you are in the traffic sequence, you need to manage your flight so that um, you know you continue in that uh, you know in that position if you like. Um, so maintain separation from other aircraft. Don't get too close to the aircraft in front. You don't want to be up right up its tailpipe. Because, for example, if you're um, if you're you know downwind when you turn onto base, you know you're still going to be close. You you've got to allow time for that aircraft to land. Okay, and bearing in mind if you're quite close when you're on final, he slows down, then you know it it could put you it could you know you could get even closer and it might put you in a really bad position. So you need to make sure that you don't get too close, but you know still maintain you know visual contact with that aircraft. Next thing you need to be um, you need to do is you need to maintain situational awareness. So it's sort of like linked up, you know, knowing what knowing where the other aircraft are. Listen to the radio, and we know the two mandatory calls are downwind and final. Um, so you know, build up that mental picture in your head where those aircraft are. If you're not quite sure what the speed, for example, of um, of uh, one of the aircraft ahead is, just ask them to report their speed. Okay, um, and then you you can uh, you can adjust accordingly. You certainly don't want to be any faster than their speed. You know, you either want to match it, or if you're a bit close, you know, 10, 20 knots less. Okay, and then the third time, as I've said, sort of like links up with what I've just said. Watch your speed. Okay, um, you, if you maintain separation, this is maybe not in the right order to be fair, but maintain se separation, maintain situational awareness, watch your speed and then make sure that you just you just follow the procedures and hopefully to be fair you know it should be uh, as uh, there's no reason why it can't be as uh, run like clockwork like it does uh, does with a carrier okay because it's very very similar but we're operating you know, obviously around an aerodrome so it's a completely different animal okay so hopefully this will increase our um, um, our realism and our professionalism you'll get an awful lot more from it um, and no one's going to get hurt when I get cut up and we're not going to have any accidents but uh, yeah it's all about just just adding a little bit more realism to what we do okay let's have a look at some uh, recap points and some standard operating procedures that we'll employ when we're operating uh, around an aerodrome. Holding points. So when you're joining a runway, make sure that you don't uh, stop too close to the runway. Make sure you honor those those holding points um, that we know now are there for, uh, for a reason. And when you've landed, don't report clear of the runway. So don't report runway vacated until such times as you've gone over, you've, you know, you've passed over the uh, that any particular holding point or as we know if there's not a holding point actually marked which a lot of them do to be fair just uh, leave a, a good taxiways width you know before you before you make that call if you're whenever you're taxiing whether it's uh, prior to the departure or after you've landed just watch your taxi speeds about 20 ish um, you know knots um, if you're able to uh, see that on uh, on any HUD for example but uh, you, you don't want to be taxiing too fast, okay? Altimeter, um, altimeter settings. So whenever you're flying in the um, in the vicinity of an aerodrome doing circuits, for example, if you wish, you obviously set the aerodrome to QFE, but only use that for circuits, okay, at that particular aerodrome. If you are departing an aerodrome, you need to set your altimeter to the QNH. So that's the atmospheric pressure adjusted for sea level, okay? The way one of the easiest ways that we can do that. There are other means, but uh, the simplest way is just bring up the F10 map, move your cursor over the uh, over the um, over the airfield, uh, over the runway, I should say, and set it to the highest point um, at that runway. Okay. So some of the runways that are coming out now are starting not to be dead flat because runways, funny enough, in the real world are not dead flat and level. So if there's a high point, set it to the highest point of that main runway. Okay, and then find out what that um, what that um, what that height readout you've got, and then set that to your altimeter. Okay, 
Um, also, you, in the briefing, if there's a Q and H in the briefing notes, then um, set your altimeter uh, to that uh, to that um, value. Okay, in the altimeter subscale, it's subscale. Um, when you're joining a circuit, for example, so if you're joining an airfield from uh, from uh, obviously being somewhere, uh, report where you're joining. Okay, and if you want to do an overhead join, which is probably one of the best ways to uh, to join the circuit pattern, then again, you know, um, report what you're doing, and don't forget the uh, compulsory calls, downwind and final. Okay, and after you've landed, report vacated. So always report uh, runway vacated. When you're flying in the circuit, whether that's whether you're doing circuits or whether you've done a, you know, had to do a missed approach, you know, um, or even if you're just joining um, uh, to land, when you're in the circuit um, pattern, try and maintain, you know, a nice rectangular pattern. Just we're from, this will be, um, uh, this is uh, we're talking visual circuit, so the runway would always be um, uh, in sight, so it should be relatively easy to maintain a good circuit pattern. If you can try and keep 90 degree turns and keep your legs, you know, either parallel or perpendicular to, you know, the runway, depending which leg you're flying, you'll find it a lot easier. Because as I, as I mentioned in the video, one of the things that's that's really hard is that if you're flying downwind and you, you know, you're a left hand downwind and you've got a little bit of left, you know, from your ideal um, track, you're only ever going to get closer to the runway. And if you're a bit close anyway, it's going to put you out of position for your final turn uh, or for your base leg turn and then on to final. So, you, you know, you're going to potentially overshoot. So you're only you're going to be losing out um, all the way, to be fair. If And if it, if it isn't right, do a go around and then uh, reposition. Um, the other SOP that I'd like to bring in on this one is um, when you're in the circuit and obviously gear down, etc. Um, landing lights on, please. So, uh, so and navigation lights so that everyone can see you. Unless, of course, it's a mission where joining we want to be a bit QT when we're joining the aerodrome. Okay, and unless that has been enforced, it's navigation lights on, landing lights on, please, so that everyone can see everyone else.